All right, good afternoon and welcome to Risk Scout's monthly webinar. Risk Scout is committed to providing insightful, thought-provoking content to bankers interested in starting and growing new business lines at their financial institutions. We provide a mix of personal and professional development to give you the tools you need to be successful. My name is Sarah Quijano and I'll serve as your moderator today. Joining me on the call is Ryan McEnerney, Senior Compliance Manager at Risk Scout, and Larry Press, Senior Vice President at Strategic Resource Management. Their combined expertise in this area of emerging markets should make for a worthwhile webinar. This month's webinar is entitled Banking Crypto, What Bankers Need to Know and Will Help You Crypto Asset Market Trends, Revenue Opportunities with Custody Arrangements, Brokerage Fees, Account Maintenance Fees, and Lending the necessary risk and compliance measures to support a program, and the roadmap you need to be successful for banking and mitigating crypto risk. Following the webinar, all registrants will receive a link to the recording via email. Our presenters will leave some time towards the end of the hour for our registrants to pose questions. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please put it in the chat box in the lower right corner of the screen. I think that takes care of our housekeeping items, so I'll now turn it over to Ryan and Larry. All right, well, thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll uh, start off what bankers need to know about crypto, and um, looking forward to going through this webinar with you all. If you do have any questions throughout, just feel free to put them into the uh, the question queue. We'll always try and get to those as we're going, or if uh, it's something we'll talk about at the end, we'll talk about the end when we have time for all the questions. So, start it off. That's myself. This is Larry with, uh, I am with Risk Out. Larry is with Strategic Resource Management. And then uh, a brief disclaimer, and I'll turn it over to, uh, to Larry to start off on some of the beginning parts here. All right, so Ryan, thank you, and I appreciate everyone joining us today. We'll be talking about uh, cryptocurrency and digital assets. I'll use those terms interchangeably. And uh, obviously, this is applicable to banks as well as credit unions, and so we'll use customer and member interchangeably as well. <clears throat> uh, just a little background on cryptocurrency and its growing popularity. It's estimated about 20-30% of Americans currently own some sort of cryptocurrency or digital asset, uh, which is pretty significant if you think about it. The uh, majority of voters in the U.S. believe that government should support the crypto industry so that we remain a world leader. A lot of conversations happening at the Congress level uh, with with legislators uh, around cryptocurrency and digital assets. And uh, I think coming out of last year's infrastructure bill, a number of our politicians realized that this was uh, here to stay and was important from a transparency and uh, from the kind of security standpoint for the U.S. So at this point, we've got a lot of support from our, our leaders as well as legislators. About 50% of financial advisors are finding their clients are asking about crypto. Um, although financial advisors aren't qualified today to advise on uh, crypto assets, and no one really is at this point because it's not the equivalent of like a Series 7, uh, they are getting questions about cryptocurrency. So it just speaks to its popularity. And 27% of Americans want to make crypto legal tender, which probably makes sense given that almost 30% of Americans own some form of cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency today is treated as a commodity from a tax standpoint. Uh, so if you were to make it legal tender, it wouldn't necessarily be taxed like the way commodities are. And a lot of those folks that have crypto uh, assets would like to be able to spend it at point of sale. About 40% of crypto owners surveyed actually purchased their first digital asset last year. So it's still fairly early. I mean, crypto has been around for 10 plus years, but it, but majority of people who've gotten into it really got into it within the last 12 months or so. And majority of crypto owners would actually like to see their primary financial institution join the crypto, crypto ecosystem. So 60% of those owners surveyed would prefer to get crypto from their primary banking app. But if it was offered, I've actually seen surveys as high as 80%. So if you think about from a membership or customer standpoint, if uh, you know 30% of your clients own crypto today, uh, majority of them, 60, 70% of them would actually prefer to get it through 
the financial institution as opposed to go into, say, a Coinbase or a third-party exchange. And then from a survey from American Banker, they found that 44% of surveyed bank execs plan to offer crypto services in 2022. I suspect that's a bit high. Uh, most of the clients we talk to, about a quarter of them are looking at offering crypto services in 2022. I'd believe that 43 or 44% number if it was uh, out uh, two years, which, uh, which probably would make sense. And then we've seen for the first time the number of U.S. citizens holding a crypto assets actually surpassed the number of citizens with a savings account. So you just think about standard savings account being a mainstay of financial services. There's actually more U.S. citizens holding crypto accounts. Yeah, and it's funny, before this uh, this broadcast started, Larry and I were chatting a little bit. So if you had joined early, you probably heard a bit of this. But down here, I'm... Um, Risk Scout and myself are down in Austin, Texas, and South by Southwest is happening. And during that, there's been a lot of events that are sponsored by NFTs. Uh, you see a lot of NFT giveaways. Some of the registrations even they'll say, "Hey, we want your public key to send you an NFT for coming." And it's it's interesting to see that popularity starting to expand and how many people want to attend things just based on an NFT brand or a cryptocurrency affiliation. So what is cryptocurrency? Well, it's really a, a digital asset used as a medium of exchange or store of value. Uh, it's probably served more as a store of value than a medium of exchange, but that is changing as we start to see uh, more retailers accepted at point of sale. In particular, online retailers are starting to accept uh, native crypto as a, as a way of, of paying for things. Ownership and transaction records are recorded on digital ledger called the blockchain, which is really just a, a distributed ledger. And then cryptocurrencies are becoming really popular, not only with kind of individuals, but institutional investors, sovereign wealth funds, and even countries. We saw El Salvador last year uh, accept Bitcoin as legal tender. So just a quick review, you can't talk about cryptocurrency without talking about what is blockchain. It's really the, the basis of a of, of decentralized cryptocurrency and, and most cryptocurrency is decentralized. There are two different types of blockchains. There's there's basically permissioned and, and non-permissioned blockchains. Most of the time when we're talking about crypto, it's really non-permissioned. Permission blockchains would be something that we would expect to see and maybe a, uh, institutional setting or, or particular, particularly if we saw a, a Fed line to central bank digital currency. Um, it is a distributed ledger. It's hosted on multiple computers or nodes that track transactions between users and is constantly cross-referencing to make sure this got the most up-to-date uh, version. And then the way I think about blockchains, I kind of think about it in terms of trains on a train track. So if crypto were your trains, the train track would be that blockchain and also within when you talk about cryptocurrency to be able to change ownership of that cryptocurrency you're generally going to be exchanging uh, keys or you're going to be using keys to sign transactions so generally you have a public and a private key that public key using the train analogy would be the equivalent of a receipt the private key would be your train ticket so you can't ride the train without the ticket but that receipt you could share with others it's the same with a, a public and a private key you, you can share that public key with others but the private key you don't ever want to share with anyone else your your crypto uh, would probably disappear yep and with the increase in kind of fraud in this area and opportunity for people to take advantage of others that don't understand the industry you see a lot of a lot of fraudsters trying to get those private keys from consumers or other individuals or entities that might have their own crypto holdings yeah ryan and what one other thing i'll add there is that you know, early on, there was a kind of saying in crypto, not not your keys, not your crypto. And while that's true, I think people are starting to understand the benefit of maybe not holding their own personal keys or those keys, you know, sitting on an exchange that that you know, has good security or sitting with a financial institution in the equivalent of a uh, kind of digital safe deposit box. Because if you lose your keys, and in, in fact, about 10 to 15 percent of all Bitcoin is locked up due to, to lost keys, you know, you're never gonna get that crypto back. And that, that kind of talks to the security of, of blockchain. Um, again, Bitcoin, about 10 to 15% of it is locked up due to lost keys. That represents about $100 billion of value. 
someone could hack that blockchain, uh, you could get access to that crypto. So that should just give you an idea of just how secure uh, blockchain is and, and the cryptographic functions as it relates to digital currencies. So what kind of digital assets are there? A uh, number of different categories. I think most people, when they think about cryptocurrencies, think Bitcoin, which would be the coin, and everything else kind of as a digital token or an altcoin. Um, those digital tokens would include things like Ethereum, Cardano, Solano, Dogecoin, um, and some of them represent a pretty big chunk of, of uh, market cap. So Bitcoin is about 44% of market cap. Uh, I think Ethereum is probably about 30% as well, and then uh, and then the rest of them a little bit smaller. But Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two primary uh, cryptocurrencies out there. Then there's another category called stable coins. It isn't essentially a cryptocurrency. It, it is. It, they do operate on the blockchain just like cryptocurrencies. It is a little bit different in that there's usually some underlying collateral bar back backing it. So Bitcoin. Uh, doesn't have anything backing it, as, as, as nor does the dollar for that matter. Dollar hasn't had anything backing it since uh, 1971 when we were taken off the gold standard. But stable coins are different. Stable coins do generally have something that backs them. And there's different types of stable coins, but most of the time when someone's talking about stable coins, they're talking about dollar backed stable coins. So basically, you got one dollar of stable coins, you have one dollar of assets sitting at a, generally at a financial institution. And then those stable coins can be used to enact transactions. The nice thing about cryptocurrency in the blockchain is this open 24 seven, 365. So as opposed to say banks or, or credit unions, you could, uh, you could run transactions outside of kind of normal banking hours. And that's what stable coins are, are, are being used, starting to be used for. Stable coins first were used on the exchanges as a way to kind of get in and out of trades, uh, particularly if you thought there was a fair amount of volatility, you'd move to a stable coin and just park your money there rather than converting it back into, say, U.S. dollars, uh, just knowing that it was backed one for one. But where we're starting to see stable coin usage is financial institutions are using it for real-time settlement, much like you could imagine using Fed now. Uh, but we're also starting to see it being looked at by retailers in terms of is there a way to use stable coins or even native digital currencies to settle at point of sale if if we start to see that and we are to some degree in the e-commerce space but if we start to see that at a point of sale then that's got obvious implications if those transactions are settled on blockchain as opposed to the traditional mastercard and visa rails which in which case obviously there's interchange passed back to the issuer. So that stable coins is something we're, we're watching very closely. Uh, there's a fair amount of regulatory discussion around stable coins. The president's working group issued some uh, guidance for Congress last year around stable coins and do expect that uh, stable coins will play a major part in, in kind of the, the future of money. Non-fungible tokens, also called NIFTIs, are um, basically a digital title for either digital or physical items. Um, they are non-fungible, meaning that they, they are unique. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of use cases for this yet with financial institutions, but I suspect in the near future we will. So you could imagine a title to say a car or a title to a, a mortgage and, and all the work that's involved in kind of validating that title and validating ownership. Well, if that was a non-fungible token, that validation could happen immediately. So there wouldn't be the need for a title search or title insurance. I think we're gonna see that. I think we're also gonna see non-fungible tokens used in the future for um, say fractional ownership um, and other sorts of use cases, but that's a little ways off. And then central bank digital currencies are uh, I think a, a real opportunity. Um, matter of fact, our Fed just produced a white paper back about three weeks ago uh, wanting to get public feedback on a retail central bank digital currency. So you could have a wholesale or a retail one. Uh, the white paper was a, around a re retail central bank digital currency, but central bank digital currency is about 90 countries looking at them right now. Uh, they do offer a fair amount of flexibility. You can think of them as a digital dollar that would be legal tender, that would allow settlement kind of instantaneous 24 seven. Uh, but 
think of it as programmable money. So some of the things that you could do with the central bank digital currency is you could apply a discount or a premium to that. So if you wanted to encourage someone to spend money before say the end of the year, you could say, look, if you if you don't spend the money by the end of the year, we're gonna discount it by, by 20%. Likewise, if you want to do, say, bring all the cash out of the system and make something completely electronic, you could say, well, for the next year, we're going to give you a 20% premium on your central bank digital currency and regular cash will be worth a dollar. Um, so you can see how from a, from a controlling kind of monetary fiscal policy, that could be useful. Likewise, because it is programmable and because it is digital money, um, you could envision a situation where every single transaction would be taxed. So in theory, there could be no, would be no tax leakage, um, which obviously would be very interest of, of a much interest from a government standpoint. Um, fair amount of controls in terms of being able to kind of control movement of capital across international borders. So capital controls, it would be a lot easier with a central bank digital currency than say hard currencies. Um, and so that, you know, there's also some privacy considerations. So we expect there's gonna be a lot more talk about central bank digital currencies. There is some, some concern that they could compete with kind of traditional, uh, the banking system, and in particular competing with deposits. So there, there's still more to come on central bank digital currencies. But right now, China is probably the one with, they're in a trial mode with theirs. They're probably a good five to 10 years from a technology standpoint, ahead of everyone else's, including the U.S. That said, the U.S. Boston Fed is working with MIT, looking at a central bank digital currency as well. I think in the meantime, we're going to see stable coins provide that kind of interim solution. And if we see a central bank digital currency at all in the U.S., I suspect we'll see a wholesale one, but we're probably a, a few years out from that. Ryan, anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, I think I'll just add a, a couple of things on the uh, the non-fungible tokens. I think a lot of questions that we get on that is really what's the use case here? It looks like for the most part, these are just kind of digital drawings and cartoons that are selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And while that sort of thing is happening, there are a couple other use cases and some interesting ones at that, say for gambling. Um, if you look online, there's actually digital horse racing and those horses are non-fungible tokens, so that ID for the horse is used as an NFT. Um, other instances that this is being used for would be, say, ticketing, um, having exclusive benefits tied to the NFT, and then that's a very secure way to say, this person has access to those benefits. So you'll see this probably used a little bit more with maybe um, kind of like that influencer network where they might wanna give rewards to some of their fans, or even the same with uh, companies that are trying to give out rewards and have that access in a secure fashion. All right, so often you'll hear about cryptocurrency being volatile or volatile asset. That is true, um, but it's really a function of its of its asset size. So cryptocurrency right now is about a $2.6, $2.7 trillion asset class. Uh, it's been as high as $3 trillion, but if you compare that to say US equities, it would represent about 1%. So with that size comes a fair amount of volatility. The way I think about it is if you, if you had a small pole and you threw a, a, a big rock in the center of it, it's gonna create some pretty big ripples. Well, if you threw that same size rock in the middle of the ocean, you wouldn't notice any ripples on uh, along the shores. So you know that, that volatility really comes from the size of that asset class. Also, the equity markets have a lot of different functions to kind of prevent that volatility, whether that be circuit breakers or other things that where people would step in and kind of adjust the market conditions so that you wouldn't have significant volatility. That does not exa exist at all in the, in the crypto markets. They are about as open of a market and supply demand driven as, as you could imagine. So different use cases, why might your customers, members, clients be, be utilizing or how might they be utilizing cryptocurrency? Well, the, the primary way they're utilizing it, I think most people would agree is, is everyone's into cryptocurrency from a speculative standpoint. Um, I'm sharing some year to date or year over year returns there. And this, this changes based on the day, but 
Bitcoin's been down year over year, but um, historically has provided about 200% annual returns, which beats any asset class out there by about a thousand percent. Ethereum year over year, 68%, uh, Binance, 61, Solano, 475. You compare that to equities right now, I think year over year, we're about even with most of them. I think the Russell 2000 is down about 6%. Uh, NASDAQ's maybe off 3% or something like that. So so clearly, you know, there is an advantage from a speculative standpoint to be vested in cryptocurrencies. That said, there's no guarantee that that's going to continue in the future, but you can understand why people are drawn to it. The other kind of use cases that we see people drawn to cryptocurrencies around store value, and particularly with Bitcoin, because again, it is limited, hard capped at 21 million Bitcoin. Um, it is, it does have a mining function that, you know, supply is coming online a little bit, you know, more every year, but it's at a decreasing rate and eventually we'll hit a hard cap of 21 million. About 18 million have already been, has already been minted. Uh, Bitcoin is decentralized, um, censorship resistant, meaning that you really can't have governments that will prevent you, uh, permit, prevent you from using it. Again, it's hard capped at 21 million, it's immutable, it's unchangeable in their network effects. So we've seen companies attracted to holding Bitcoin on their balance sheets. We've seen individuals holding it again, a lot of times as an, uh, a hedge against inflation. And then the third use case, which is probably one of the most interesting ones, is we're seeing actual transaction solutions that crypto is being utilized for. So these would be things like international remittances. And if you think about international remittance costs for like a Western Union or, or any sort of money transfer, like a money gram, um, those typically are about five to six percent, could be even higher. In general, it'll take a couple of days to reach the intended recipient. Now with crypto, you can send it instantaneously, sometimes for as low as pennies on the dollar. Um, we're also seeing it used for real-time settlement. As I mentioned before, we're starting to see that with stable coins and other cryptocurrencies. We're starting to see it used for payment, whether it's online or point of sale or just individual P2P uh, payment solutions. And then we're also seeing decentralized finance solutions. And decentralized finance is basically crypto or banking-like solutions completely outside of the banking sec sector. So instead of having an in, a third party intermediary in the middle to kind of facilitate those transactions, we're using we're seeing software being used to do all sorts of you know traditional finance like lending, borrowing, trading, insurance, synthetics, derivatives, and others. And I think an interesting point you made, Larry, is on the uh, the store of value side when we talk about blockchain being immutable. And so the basically the record of that chain can't be changed. Um, but then people will say, okay, well, if we have this kind of backdated record that shows transactions with everybody, why is it we can't identify certain transaction recipients and we say that cryptocurrency can be used to kind of obscure, uh, obscure, obscure ownership? And the reason for that is that immutable record is of those keys we talked about before with the wallets transacting with one another. And so if you have an exchange that isn't sharing the wallet holder information, then that's how you get an obscured identity. And we actually had a meeting with the uh, the FBI. They were presenting at one of the um, certified financial crime specialist uh, events a couple of weeks ago. And they were talking about how they're actually sanctioning some of these exchanges in some different countries that aren't providing that wallet information because it's making it difficult to track maybe the ownership of that specific uh, transaction and entity. So I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and you know, along that lines of tracking and tracing, you know, early on, I think there was a maybe a misunderstanding that, but criminals thought that blockchain was totally anonymous, and it turns out is it's really quasi anonymous. While you you know you don't have owners, you don't know from an ownership standpoint, you do have all those transactions are linked, and so eventually, if you know of, you can find either that the end user, beginning user. You know whether they went through an exchange or somewhere else, you can then start to trace all those transactions, and they're finding that actually it's fairly easy to trace movement of cryptocurrency on those blockchains. And there are companies out there like Cipher, Cipher Trace, and Chainalytics that do that for all of the government three-letter agencies. So crime has fallen from probably early on in the days of crypto, where illicit transactions might have been 20% of the transactions. 
it's fallen to less than a quarter percent of transactions, which is far less than cash, which is typically about seven to eight uh, percent from a transaction standpoint. All right, so moving into uh, adoption and some of those use cases that you might actually be able to have this uh, functionally used at your financial institution. Yes, yeah, so uh, first one would be decentralized finance. And this is both uh, risk and opportunity. I've got a picture of a taxi there. Everyone's familiar with the, the Uber story and what happened to the taxi industry. Taxi industry was highly regulated with uh, high barriers to entry, whether that be you had to have a, a fleet of taxis, you had a dispatch center, you had to have $100,000 taxi medallions. A taxi industry assumed they would never be able to be disintermediated. Well, came along a little company called Uber that did not consider itself a taxi industry, did not have any taxi fleet, and decided to connect people who had cars to drive with people who had riding needs uh, using software. And that same sort of peer-to-peer -peer activity is starting to disrupt the financial system, and that's decentralized finance. So it's open, uh, transparent, permissionless, trustless, decentralized, has compostability, basically meaning you can kind of use it like financial Lego and build upon each other. But these DeFi applications are a growing list include borrowing, lending, trading, payments, insurance. What I'll, I always give the example of, I can do the equivalent of a, a certificate of deposit today with three clicks of my cell phone and the privacy of my own home without any requirements around know your customer, where the money come from, anything along those lines. And I can do it with any amount of money and earn a yield of say, you know, and it depends based on supply and demand, but earn a yield of anywhere from say three to 6%, you can kind of compare that to a certificate of deposit, which is gonna require going down to your local, local branch, maybe explaining where the money you're gonna put in the certificate deposit came from. Um, you're gonna to have to go through some disclosures of paperwork, and ultimately you're gonna sign up for a CD that's gonna probably have an early termination fee and gonna pay you a quarter percent interest rate. So that's what financial institutions are up against. They're up against these decentralized finance apps that offer, again, traditional lending, borrowing, uh, trading, payments, insurance type solutions, but without any third party intermediary. And because there's no third party intermediary in the middle with all of the associated costs, both ends of that trade get better pricing. And we've seen really significant growth over the past year. Uh, DeFi grew up to about, a, about $100 billion from almost zero in the course of the year. It's come down a bit now, but if you kind of extrapolate that out, we could see it at, at some point in time where, you know, it's a it's a trillion dollars or two trillion dollars locked up in decentralized finance, and those are applications directly competing with traditional finance. Now, the good news is, is we're talking with a number of clients about, well, is there a way to use that efficiency of decentralized finance and kind of those smart apps to provide better yield solutions for your clients that they might not be able to get on their own. And that's exactly what's what's what we're looking at doing. And in fact, what you could do is you could say if you wanted to put, you know, be able to provide say lending yield, you could probably get six, seven percent yield on it. You could ensure that protocol, whether it's like with a compound or Ave for probably 200 basis points. So you've got 500 basis points yield left over. You could pass on one or two percent to your clients and then take the rest as a spread for yourself. So you know th those are better yields than you could get with probably just about anything else. And so there are opportunities to use that efficiency of DeFi um, to the benefit of the financial institution. And, and that's you know an interesting use case. Um, just also talk about adoption real quick. Uh, you know, crypto adoption is very much on par with the internet. Uh, if you kind of put it on a similar sort of timeline, if you think back 20 years, what the internet was like and how complicated it was and how little usage there was and now where it is today, where we've got billions of users, internet is very easy to use. We're seeing the same sort of thing happen with cryptocurrency adoption. It's becoming easier to use over time and the number of users is increasing pretty significantly. I think uh, right now it's about 350, 370 million users worldwide, but you know, and then, couple of years from now, it could easily be at a, a billion users worldwide. An interesting uh, conversation that Larry and I were having when we were kind of prepping these slides for you all was when you look at 
just the general maturity of a market typically takes around 30 or so years. So when we look at cryptocurrency now, and it's been around 10 to 15 years for the most part, um, people think, wow, the value is really high. This has kind of skyrocketed. It's probably, I feel like it's too late for me to get in. Well, we're probably nowhere near the peak of this yet. So I wouldn't say that it's anywhere close to maturity. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and same with the clients that we're working with. We always tell them it's, this is still very early on. In fact, there's a lot of um, early adopter advantages kind of being the first in market with some of these things. This is an interesting slide. This is actually from Visa and they surveyed a thousand household decision makers. And what they found was that, you know, majority of people were certainly aware of cryptocurrency. So there's definitely that awareness in the marketplace. Uh, their survey found 33% own crypto. That's a little bit higher than what we typically see on surveys, but still just gives you an idea of, of how popular it is. But 84% of the surveyed folks were actually invest, interested in crypto rewards, which makes a lot of sense because you think about rewards these days, airline points certainly aren't as popular given the pandemic. Uh, cashback, which is very popular, I mean, just given the inflation rate, if I get $10 of cashback today, you know, a year from now, that's going to be worth $9. You give me $10 of crypto, uh, you know, by the Bitcoin or something else, a year from now, that could be worth $100. It's kind of like giving your clients a lottery ticket. So there's a lot of interest in crypto rewards. Um, likewise, because there are 30% folks that have crypto, a lot of people are interested in crypto linked cards. And what we're typically seeing are crypto linked debit cards. So your debit card basically would link to a crypto wallet that would allow you to use those digital assets at point of sale. They get typically converted at point of sale to cash for the merchants because the merchants don't want to necessarily deal with crypto and that volatility. That said, I do know some merchants that are starting to take, say, half of those crypto payments and they're starting to keep half of it in crypto and convert half of it to, to USD. So the thought there is, is they're starting to look at that either as you know something they want to do from a treasury management standpoint or balance sheet standpoint. That's very interesting because it, it, it is native crypto that they're taking. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I think we're going to see stable coins, which again will be native crypto, start to, to sneak into the payment system and, and every merchant in the world because of their merchant costs are certainly looking at that. But the crypto link uh, cards is a way of allowing people to use that crypto at point of sale today, running through the traditional Visa and MasterCard networks because it settles that way and uh, still get that interchange passed through to uh, to the issuer. And then how many would be likely to switch banks based on crypto services? So this case was 18%. Now keep in mind that kind of a randomly selected group of, of household folks. Um, if you actually look at people who own crypto, you'd see that generally 60, 70, 80 percent of them would actually change financial institutions if one offered crypto services. And that goes back to those cryptographic keys. If you lose access to those cryptographic key, keys, you lose access to your crypto. So people are starting to realize that from a safety standpoint, it might be better to have those keys held at your trusted financial institution. Likewise, for people who aren't as familiar with the crypto market, that doesn't know what you know Kraken is or finance, they may not be comfortable giving them kind of the you know, standard client information that you would need to, to go through the standard know your customer transactions, that, but they would be comfortable giving that to their trusted financial um, institution. So the opportunity there is to allow, you know, to take, take custody and allow your clients to trade uh, crypto instead of having to go to an exchange and as a result capture that fee revenue. <clears throat> so who are, who are the who are the folks that are using cryptocurrency? I think it sometimes surprises people. It's a lot more diverse than you might think. 30% um, of African Americans, 27% of Latinos, and 17% of whites own crypto. We, so we tend to see more people of color with crypto. They tend to be more diverse. Uh, we see more underbanked that are using crypto, and that makes sense because crypto is providing solutions outside of traditional finance. So for folks that might not be or might be underserved by, say, banks and credit unions, they're going to cryptocurrency or neobanks or, or fintechs for those solutions. Likewise, 
uh, users of cryptocurrency tend to be a lot younger. So the, it, it's, a, it's a lot more uh, geared towards younger folks and in particular millennials and, and you think about what that means. You know, financial institutions have had a hard time attracting millennials historically, yet millennials are going to be the recipients of the largest wealth transfer that the world's ever seen as baby boomers die off. And so we're going to need to attract those folks, and those folks today are going to the neo banks, the fintechs, the crypto exchanges, not the traditional financial so, uh, solution providers. So cryptocurrency is it you know does give you an opportunity to attract a more diverse, uh, younger population, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, one thing we used to see when I was with the OCC was a lot of banks there. They're customer base was starting to age out and there was a lot of consolidation. Uh, we used to go into, we had this data retrieval system that you can go in and see just the number of active charter numbers. And you could check that every week and there was maybe two or three fewer institutions than previously. And that would include all commercial banks, uh, mutuals, credit unions, just across the, uh, across the landscape. So this is a good opportunity just to try and at least uh, improve that that diversity and age range, at least for your customer base, and hopefully get some of those customers that might have been switching to a larger bank or someone that has different services to uh, to remain at your institution. Well, and you'll you'll see that those neo banks, which are becoming wildly popular, almost all of them offer crypto solutions. Yep. Yeah. Hundred percent. So in addition to individuals, uh, cryptocurrency and digital assets being popular with individuals, uh, we're seeing it also popular with institutions, uh, companies, and even countries. So you know, there are a number of trusts out there, Grayscale is, I believe, the largest one. I've got Bitcoin. I think they've got Ethereum Trust as well. Uh, those are e e ETFs. Um, I do think we'll see a spot ETF at some point um, this year, hopefully, but uh, all of the applications so far have been turned down by the SEC. Uh, we've seen countries adopt crypto or a country, and that would be El Salvador, I think primarily because of the international remittance component. A lot of their citizens are sending money back to El Salvador and be able to do that through uh, Bitcoin and some of the kind of second layer solutions. Uh, it's, a, it's an inexpensive way to send money a uh, number of other countries, Panama, Paraguay, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, are looking at similar sort of solutions. Again, I think primarily because of that international remittance component. Then we've seen a number of public companies, uh, Tesla, MicroStrategy is probably being the most two famous ones, but there are about probably 50 to 60 American public companies that are actually holding crypto on their balance sheets. And, and, and so you know, that always surprises folks. A number of private companies as well, uh, Mass Mutual, uh, KPMG, which I think is a public company. Uh, they're an accounting firm. Uh, their Canadian version of KPMG uh, recently brought Bitcoin and some Ethereum onto their balance sheets. And I think they also purchased a, uh, an NFT as a way to just kind of better understand that market because certainly there are a number of changes around accounting regulations that are, that are gonna be coming as well. Yeah, it was funny. I think uh, there's a lot more companies that, that actually hold crypto than people expect, and some are even mining it. I remember there was uh, there was one bank that we had gone to, and we're doing the IT review, and they're like, we go down to the uh, the server room, and there's just a mining rig set up in the corner. We're like, what what's going on there? They're like, oh, we just want to better understand cryptocurrency, so we decided to mine it. So, That's okay. awesome. Yeah. So we're also seeing uh, venture capital putting a whole lot of money into cryptocurrency. So last year, $30 billion was invested in cryptocurrency, a lot of it to uh, companies that were involved in trading, custody, uh, rewards, all of the things that financial institutions would do. In fact, this year, based on early indications, it looks it's looking like $50 billion of venture capital will be poured into the crypto industry. And that doesn't even count kind of institutional clients or institutional companies, you know, the, the MasterCards and Visas of the world, the Fiserv's, FIS's, all of those companies are investing and betting huge on crypto and digital assets. And so I mentioned earlier that we're starting to see crypto show up uh, in the kind of 
as alternatives to traditional payment rails. Uh, I think it's you know it's kind of surprising sometimes for folks to realize that Bitcoin last year had more settlement volume than Visa. So Visa settled about 11 trillion, 12 trillion in 2022. A Bitcoin settled 13 trillion. Now it's not an apples to apples comparison. They're very different sorts of things. But I mentioned stable coins earlier. Stable coins are starting to sneak into retail settlement. Or certainly merchants are looking at that. And uh, stable coins settled about 6 trillion in value last year, which was about half of what Visa did. Um, those kind of tokens coins on the left would be some examples of stable coins. Some of these other companies on here are ones that have um, e-commerce solutions where either you know the, the the merchant will accept most of the time they're getting converted into cash some of it will accept it in native uh, crypto flex is a really interesting company it's worth looking up they're taking um, at point of sale and they're using an app connecting it to kind of your your uh, digital like a, a, a crypto wallet and allowing you to use that crypto at point of sale and they, they will convert it into US dollars, but they're doing it in providing instant settlement, uh, which is interesting because people who know crypto know that some of the crypto doesn't settle all that fast. And what they're doing is they're kind of taking that settlement risk for, for a price, but still at a, a much lower cost than settling, say, over traditional rails of MasterCard and Visa. We're going to see more of this. Um, I know Walmart, I think, invested in looking into building out a stable coin, uh, PayPal is, I think someone realized that PayPal was working on a stable coin solution. Then we're seeing uh, traditional banks and credit unions start to look at uh, pay or uh, stable coins as, as settlement solutions as well. Some of that for kind of interbank, intrabank settlement, but some of it uh, potentially for consumer settlement. So how are financial institutions actually adopting cryptocurrency solutions and, and bringing them to their clients? Well, everything kind of starts with custody. And custody, again, is that digital safe deposit box. You think about safe deposit box, you're not really, you know, you're holding your client's assets, at your safe deposit box, but you're not really, that doesn't count, get counted on your balance sheet. Well, custodial services is pretty much the same way. You can set up custody where kind of a financial institution is self-custodying. But most of the time, this is done through third-party providers. Um, they tend to be pretty big ones uh, in the crypto industry. But what we've seen is some banks will actually do self-custody, and they, they're they providing solutions for large institutional clients that might have, say, $50 million of, of crypto that they want to bring on to into the bank. Uh, they will go ahead and they'll do that, but they're gonna go through kind of a know your customer in a, in a search, a blockchain search to make sure that those funds, uh, crypto digital asset funds aren't coming from a, a sanctioned country or a prohibitive person. Uh, custodial services is really the um, foundation of everything else, depending on how you set that up, gives you flexibility to do a lot of other things or maybe less flexibility to do a lot of other things. Um, most of the entry points at least initially is for financial institutions has been around crypto trading. So what they're trying to do is capture back some of that volume that's headed out to the exchanges and allow that volume or that trading to happen um, at the bank or credit union. And, and, and the way that's being implemented is generally through your mobile banking provider. There's a number of, of early solution providers that have kind of integrated well with these digital banking providers. There are a lot of other ones that are looking to integrate through that digital banking provider, but that would mean basically your your digital banking app that would show your clients, uh, say, checking account and savings account information. You could also show basically a digital asset balance and allow you to buy and sell crypto. Um, some of the early providers only did Bitcoin only. Um, some of the better solutions out there offered, you know, maybe Bitcoin, Ethereum, or, or, or even more than that. A good use case to look at would be Vast Bank. They're out of Oklahoma. When they launched, I think they launched with uh, about a uh, half a dozen trading pairs or ultimately up to, I think, a dozen uh, cryptocurrencies that their clients can, can leverage. And they were an early adopter. Uh, last year, about mid-year, they launched, I believe, I think it was a couple, about eight weeks after launching, they increased their client by 
client base by 25%, and I think 80 weeks post launch, they've actually increased their client base uh, fivefold. So, you know, it, it pays to be an early adopter in this space. Uh, as mentioned before, rewards programs are very popular. So, you know, adding crypto rewards can be a good way to uh, kind of reinvigorate uh, checking or, or debit uh, card offering. And some other uh, solutions. One solution I didn't put on here, I'm just going to mention real quick, is yield. So depending on how custody is set up or depending on the third party provider that you would work with, there are also yield opportunities. So those yield opportunities could be the DeFi that we talked about earlier. They could be staking, which is kind of a way of securing the blockchain outside of proof of work, it's called, called proof of stake. But there are ways to generate yield by staking uh, basically digital assets with a provider. Um, those are some very interesting use cases to provide yield higher than you could uh, provide your clients today. Um, lending is a, another one of those use cases. And this is twofold. This is lending uh, to your clients that might have existing digital assets, using those digital assets as collateral. So it's usually an over collateralized loan and is set up much like, a, you know, a, um, kind of like if you were going to lend uh, to, you know, against equities where, you know, if the equity moved enough or in this case, your crypto assets decreased enough in value, it would be like a call on that loan and you'd liquidate those those holdings. So it does put some risk to the client, doesn't put any risk on the financial institution because, again, it's an over collateralized loan. It's a great way to earn pretty significant yield on a loan product with little to no risk. And then the other opportunity is, if, you know, if there's a number of locales, kind of increasing number, where crypto mining or the crypto industry uh, could be, uh, you know, providers of the mining industry, could be node operators, could be uh, just, you know, liquidity providers, whatever it may be, you know, crypto companies. A lot of those, them have their own liquidity needs. So number of uh, kind of banks and credit unions have looked to lend to those institutions and by doing so can really have some pretty significant impact. Uh, Silvergate is a good example, Southern California uh, Bank. And when they launched uh, lending to the crypto industry, they grew their asset base by over $10 billion overnight. Um, mentioned earlier, stable coins, per president's working group uh, recommendations, they're gonna recommend that uh, the money that stable coins are kind of collateralized with have to be held at financially insured institution. Uh, I believe that those, that underlying collateral will be able to be re-lent out much much like a standard deposit. And so it will just be another source of funding for financial institutions. So a number of financial institutions are starting to get involved in that. They're also using it for, again, interbank settlement. And then blockchain crypto technology. is broader than just crypto. Um, you can secure sensitive data. Not sure if uh, Larry cut out for everyone or just me, but uh, head over to the next slide. Hopefully, uh, hopefully y'all can hear him. So. Moving from the uh, the actual exposure to a lot of those different fields, just understanding the burden as a financial institution for trying to engage some of these areas. So if we're talking about custodial services, as we mentioned before, uh, the revenue opportunity there is probably the lowest of these, but it's also going to be one of the easiest areas to enter. Particularly if you don't have that subject matter expertise on your team yet, this is a good way to start to learn and start to uh, better expose yourself to enter maybe into the trading area or to the lending areas. When we look at trading, the revenue opportunity is probably in the mid-range, um, and that's typically based on per transaction charges. So some of those could be relatively high, some of them could be uh, relatively standard. But so, for example, some we've seen that from 150 basis points to 300 basis points just per transaction. Uh, so that can be a good source of revenue if you have the infrastructure to support it. But that is typically where the the challenge starts to come in is on actually having the infrastructure to implement the trading platform or trading ability. And then on the lending side, revenue opportunity here is really middle to high in terms of the uh, the distribution. 
And a lot of that's just going to be on the net interest margin spread that you're going to gain. And you could get a lot of deposits from these customers you might be lending to. So that's one benefit as well. And this could also be for not only, as Larry mentioned, off of the asset, but it could be lending off of uh, or lending to industry kind of agnostic participants. So maybe someone that's manufacturing a machinery, someone that's developing software, a point where you're not actually lending to the cryptocurrency itself or on the cryptocurrency itself, but somebody that has exposure to the industry. And the risk there is typically a bit lower because most financial institutions already have some sort of exposure to the lending environment. Thanks for picking up there, Ryan. Uh, for some reason, my computer had frozen, but I'm back. All right, great. I was afraid I was just talking over you at the same time, and then maybe I wasn't hearing things and everyone else heard the <laughs> two of us at the same time. So it all worked out. <laughs> yep. So when we talk about uh, cryptocurrency industry supporters, uh, I mentioned that a little bit in the previous slide, but these are the individuals who produce goods or services that support cryptocurrency market participation or expansion. So this could be people that aren't really exposed to a lot of the regulatory burdens that would be in the cryptocurrency space, but there's still a good amount of opportunity there. That market back in 2020 was about one and a half billion dollars and the projected market size by 2030 is almost five billion. So there's plenty of opportunity here to go around. There are a lot of larger firms in it, but there are also some smaller firms. So depending on the size of your financial institution, there's still some ability to have exposure into that space. And this is a pretty high growth rate comparatively to a lot of uh, a lot of other industries um, and relatively high when you're looking at just high risk markets in general. The only ones that I see maybe higher than this would be say the hemp market. I think they were growing at over 20% for a while. Uh, cannabis might be growing a little bit faster than this as well. But keep in mind, this is just one subset of the cryptocurrency market. Now, when we're talking about actually building your program, the important thing is building that expertise. That's obviously one of the, the most challenging areas because a lot of people that have the skill in this area in, uh, in this industry are kind of getting poached all over the place. You see people changing companies all the time um, and just trying to get that knowledge can be a little bit more challenging. So just knowing what internal parties at your financial institution need to be involved, who needs to be learning, why are you considering the new industry? Is it to increase your net interest margin spread? Is it to increase the amount of deposits you have? Is it to support your um, support your customer base? Is it to get new customers? What's the reason you want to enter? And then what is the definition of success for you entering? And then lastly, what don't you understand at this point? And if you can identify what you don't know, then you can start to interview people, say myself, regulators, other parties, to try and answer those questions, make sure you have the information you need. So some of those external discussions could be industry experts, they could be other financial institutions. They could be regulators. Uh, Larry, is there anyone else that you would think about talking to in this space? Um, you know, there's 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 a lot of good information that's out there on the internet. There's also a lot of bad information. Um, for anyone that wants to just get a good cursory understanding of kind of digital asset space, uh, MIT offered a free course. You can look it up on YouTube with uh, our treasurer, uh, uh, SEC head. Gary Gensler actually taught the course. So if you look up Gary Gensler, MIT crypto, you'll get a, a great free class. I think it's 24 classes. Uh, there each one's about an hour and a half long. So it, there's a lot of information there, but in terms of uh, just getting general information from knowledge, that, that's a good place to start. Great. And we do, uh, I know we only have about six, seven minutes left. So I'll go a little quicker through some of these. There's gonna be other information back here just about forming the program. If people have questions on that after the fact, feel free to reach out to either of us. We're happy to kind of discuss any of this. Yep. Larry and I get a little excited on the, uh, the actual content of cryptocurrency and can't help ourselves. <laughs> just it in there. So on the industry expert side, uh, that could be participants like myself, that could be Larry, that could also be people that are maybe developing some of these Web3 platforms or decentralized autonomous organizations, which are companies that are built basically off of blockchain. But some of the questions that you might want to be considering to ask to those people, have there been significant changes in the industry? What have they seen that's changing that maybe isn't coming out in the news yet, or you're not going to get in a publishment or a book? And then what are the common struggles you see at institutions that take on this kind of activity? If you can talk to anyone that's been consulting with different financial institutions, they'll see a lot of different problems, a lot of different challenges. So knowing what those are and being able to plan for them ahead is definitely helpful. 
And then one of my favorite phrases, trust but verify, which we used at the Treasury Department all the time. Um, sometimes these can be vendors, sometimes they can be people that might have other intentions by giving you certain information. So try and get multiple sources, make sure that you're vetting that information before you're using it. Hey Ryan, real quick, the, the significant changes in the industry, everyone needs to just keep in mind, crypto industry moves extremely quickly. And if you're reading it online or in the media, it's probably a, a few weeks old. So it's just a just a consideration. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're reading this stuff all the time, and I'm still not 100% up to date on what's happening because it just moves so quickly. So, questions you might ask other financial institutions when I mentioned the prior slide, just what struggles did a a uh, external expert see from financial institutions experiencing? Ask that same question to the uh, the FI. What struggles did you have in actually standing up your program? A lot of times I think that'll be staffing, sometimes it might be technological, sometimes it might be a combination of the two. Second question are what are the staffing requirements like? And if they are giving you some sort of number for the staffing requirements, make sure you're also checking what sort of third party providers they're using or what other tools they might be using that support their staff. Typically there can be a good balance between say a third party tool and the actual staffing at the financial institution. Since it is so hard to find some of these qualified part or parties to uh, to work with you, if you can make them more efficient with some sort of solution or vendor, that's one way to, to enhance your efficiency, enhance your ability to take on these clients. Now on the regulatory side, I might be a little bit biased because I used to be a regulator, but uh, I think there are a lot of good, valuable insights you can get by talking to your regulator, particularly identifying a plan and then providing it to them to give you some feedback on. Typically, you're not gonna get just blanket information if you say, hey, um, I'm thinking about doing this, is that okay? What you will get good information on is, this is our plan for doing it. Do you see any issues with what our plan is? Uh, and also, can you provide any best, best practice recommendations? Typically, your regulator, whether they be state, federal, or otherwise, have seen how this works at a lot of different institutions. They've seen how it works better, they've seen how it works worse, and some of those best practices are usually willing to share. Not only that, it helps that they're gonna give you some buy-in before the examination, they'll know what's going on, they're not surprised when they come on site or over a Zoom call and they're like, oh, you're doing all this now? I, I really had no idea that was happening, a little bit concerned. So getting that buy-in is definitely important. So the next piece is just fitting with your culture. Uh, one thing that we see a lot of is fitting the risk appetite of the institution. And what I'll say with that, this is just the standard ISO definition of risk appetite, a mountain type of risk the organization is willing to pursue or retain. Um, the risk appetite of the institution can drive why or when you might enter into the market. And what I mean by that is when we look at what goes into risk appetite, the culture, the mission, maybe your board members, your strategy, even the mission and vision can be a good reason to enter because it might be you want to support support your your well, support your community, support the people that actually bank at your institution or use your institution. Uh, so one example of that would be if we look at this mission statement, meet and exceed the needs of community of somewhere bank through superior customer service by offering necessary access to financial system resources. Well, that could be a good reason to enter the cryptocurrency market because you want to provide access to those financial system resources that otherwise some of your client base might not otherwise be able to get to. So the first question is, what can we do now? How can we already provide that sort of access? And then going forward, what's the roadmap for us to be able to do more and how can we do it? So the first step in any of this is performing a needs assessment. Assess what your technical cap capabilities are for these different revenue stream offerings, whether that be the trading, the lending, whatever areas you might be interested in. And then once you figure out what you possibly can do, deciding which of those fit with that risk appetite you have. Uh, and then if you start to see things that maybe you can't do yet, what's the plan for being able to do them in the future? Now, one, one slide I really love, and I'm, I wanted to get to this one, is uh, during the pandemic, I had never actually cut up a pineapple. So I did that for the first time and started to learn that there's a lot of pieces that I don't want to eat in a pineapple. That's going to be the same way when you're looking at any of these revenue streams. So you really want to cut out the areas that don't align with your risk appetite. That could be based on a geograph geographical exposure. That could be based on maybe just a higher level of risk with some sort of customer. And figuring out who you want to bank and how you want to bank them is going to make this a lot easier for a process. 
and then building the whole foundation of this, you're looking at researching and evaluating the new market through all of these different conversations, that operational analysis, partnering with different individuals, and then you're documenting your policies, procedures, and tailoring for the risks that are specific to your market, specific to maybe your institution or potentially the customers that you serve. And then just aligning any limitations you do have with your risk appetite. So if we're developing workflows, figure out how are we gonna get these customers in? What is a customer that I'm willing to accept? And then how do I risk rate them? How do I educate my own customers and my staff so that everything goes off smoothly? Well, the first piece is gonna be designing an onboarding application. This image on the right is a standard application funnel that I pulled directly off the internet that is not at all specific to this conversation. But what's important to know is when you do offer these kind of programs, you get a lot of different applicants. It's kind of a uh, field of dream scenario. A lot of these people are looking for banks or uh, credit unions, and if they start to find them, a lot of applications come in, but many of those individuals do not align with your risk appetite or the customers you'd want to take on. So filtering out those unwanted customers at the front end, whether you have a third-party application for that or some other way, it's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of effort with your staff. You also want to collect, with any, collect information up front that assists with onboarding, having multiple uh, kind of iterations of going back and forth with the customer is gonna slow things down and just really make it more difficult to operate this kind of program. Then lastly, make sure whoever's working on the applications is well-trained, understands what is the criteria for getting rid of or getting a application out of the queue and what's a criteria for moving it on. So this is just a quick, kind of account approval process that I drafted up for uh, for an example. So if we have multiple divisions in a financial institution working together a little bit more closely when you're working with these higher risk industries, particularly like cryptocurrency, or uh, say if you're into some sort of other high risk market. And that app application coming from a prospect is usually gonna come from your business development area. Well, going from business development, you might send it to treasury management because it's cash intensive type account. Well, Treasury management's gonna say, this meets our acceptance criteria from a profitability standpoint. Maybe I'll send it to compliance. Then compliance starts to vet things from a licensing aspect, just from a relative risk aspect, and you decline or approve, and then send it back to the treasury management area. Have an account officer that's engaging with the customer there, making sure that you're getting that information on an ongoing basis. Uh, you have an established review cadence with that account officer to review the customer. So this is just one hypothetical version. This could be more complicated. It could be less complicated. Uh, it's going to work based on how your institution is actually set up and what resources you have. Larry, any comments on the, uh, I guess, kind of that individual workflow? No, that, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Want to make sure I'm not cutting you off over here. <laughs> So when we're talking about internally risk rating clients, that could mean a lot of different things. Um, typically, it's going to be developed off of your own internal risk rating criteria, and that criteria could be specific to the type of customer you're taking on or the type of industry that you're serving, even within cryptocurrency. A lot of things that you might be thinking could be geography. It could be the industry itself. It could be the size of the company. It could be the age. Uh, for example, if we were looking at miners, if you have a single entity mining solution that's using one kind of computer that's going to have one risk versus if you have a pooled mining arrangement where those funds are being distributed to a lot of different computing players throughout uh, maybe the us or geographically across the world now measure the cost to maintain that account and make sure that's informing the actual pricing decision i can't describe how many times i've seen someone charging what appears to be a decent amount for a service and really they're losing money because of the amount of time and effort software and staff are taking on the back end. And then lastly, using those ratings to inform your ongoing due diligence plans. If a customer is a higher risk level or needs more, uh, a higher level of touch point, try and have that risk rating identify that. So you can say all my four level risk rates have uh, semi-annual reviews. All of my level threes are annual, all my level twos are uh, biannually, whatever it might be. Now, another piece that's important is educating the involved parties on those ongoing requirements. And so that's not only going to be the customer, but that's going to be your financial institution staff as well. You really want to set the monitoring and information collection expectations with the customer at account opening, 
they are probably not used to having this higher level of engagement with the financial institution. Uh, if I got my one to four family mortgage and said, hey, you need to send me your tax returns biannually to, uh, to the bank so we can verify that you're the person you said you are and you still make the same amount of money, I'd be a little confused. And it's kind of the same thing when you have these companies that might have been a business prior, different industry, they're not used to having that same level of engagement with a financial institution. So letting them know that is definitely helpful. You also want to inform the assigned account officer of what those ongoing requirements are and determine a good strategy for them to coordinate with compliance. I think that's one of the more challenging pieces in this is when you start to loop compliance into just the ongoing management. Uh, it's, it's a new space for them to be in. A lot of times compliance, maybe Bank Secrecy Act staff, anti-money laundering staff are on the back end. They're not used to that as much. They're typically routing things through either treasury management or another part of the financial institution. And lastly, involving any branches that would be involved with the customer, uh, particularly if there's a cash intake element to it. So some third-party solutions you might be considering in the space could be onboarding, could be ongoing monitoring, verification, the transaction review side, relationship management, maybe a combination of all of these. And there are others that there could be as well. Uh, the reason some of these might be beneficial is say, for example, when we're thinking about onboarding, if I can get all of the information in my application and then just say, yep, this applicant is meeting our risk criteria and then moving that forward to the next step without actually having to check all of that, maybe having that done automatically, you could save yourself a lot of time, reduce some of the effort that you might be seeing from a purely staff-based level. So application screening, really important, helps you scale. Workflow optimization, what I mentioned before with that communication between different divisions at your financial institution can be a little challenging. So if you have something that can help you get information from a client automatically, uh, helps you get information from say, treasury management to compliance and back, that's really useful. It's something that I think is incredibly valuable and sometimes uh, under identified in the analysis of this, uh, this industry. Also document collection, if you can automate those collection requests, that's gonna be really helpful. Uh, one thing that we used to see a lot just from a regulatory perspective would be delays on annual reviews for commercial credit. And the reason for that, I don't think was a malicious intent by the customer or the client, but really a uh, just, it seems like a lot of work for them to send it in. They didn't want to do that. So if you can make that easier for them, that's going to be great. And if you collect that information ahead of when you're doing any reviews on these customers and clients, then that's going to be even better. You'll probably have the information when you want to do the review. You won't be delayed on it. Your regulators are going to love it. They have a great relationship. Now, just an example of when a third-party solution might be beneficial and when it not, would not be beneficial uh, is an example of a money service business. Now, the reason I show a money service business, I'm not going to go too far down the weeds in the compliance side of things, but a lot of cryptocurrency-related entities can actually start to fall as a money transmitter. There's a, a user, exchanger, or an administrator could be the three designations according to FinCEN, and some of those will be money transmitters. Now, if we had a money service business here, the example profitability, say you're charging $1,000 a month, so that's $12,000 per year, earning some money on the deposits of, that they're leaving with that reserve account, and then the cost to maintain might be your manual employee cost, say only 40 hours a year. That would be uh, impressive if you could pull that off. And uh, that's just taking some of that financial gain out of there. Well, if we can use a software solution to actually reduce how much we're paying there, maybe we increase that 14,400 to 15,200 per customer. If we just start to scale up, say we have 100 customers, 200 customers, that really starts to add up. It's also improving the internal efficiency. Uh, if you're having trouble scaling up from a staffing perspective, starting to augment that with a software solution is going to be really beneficial. It's also beneficial for the customer. If it's easier for them to give information to you, uh, if it's easier for them to maintain their account, they're probably gonna be a little bit happier with the experience. So I kind of rushed a little bit at the end there just because I didn't uh, don't wanna keep you all too pat far past three o'clock, but I think we can take a, a couple of minutes for questions if anybody has any, or uh, Sarah, if there's already any in the queue. Yeah, so let's see. All right, here's a question. 
are there any pitfalls to avoid in selecting a partner for implementing a crypto solution? Sure, I'll take that. Um, there definitely is. So a lot of the early solutions we've seen in the marketplace for financial services have bit Bitcoin only solutions. Um, one of the problems we see with that is a Bitcoin only solution, while might be attractive in terms of simplicity, is not attractive in terms of how competitive it is. Uh, the exchanges offer, you know, even the most simplest exchange probably offers two dozen digital assets to trade. If you've got Bitcoin only, you're easily losing half of the trading revenue and it's not going to be competitive enough to win that behavior or those deposits that are heading out to the crypto exchanges. And in fact, what it may do is just encourage people who aren't familiar with crypto to try Bitcoin and then as they start to get interested in other digital assets, they are ultimately going to go to the exchange. So, you know, be careful to select a solution that is not Bitcoin only exclusive. Uh, in addition to that, make sure that you understand how these solutions are priced. There's often, if you're a liquidity a provider or a market maker, there is a spread. Some of the early solution providers aren't sharing that spread. They're just sharing uh, basically a trading fee. So there's lots of different revenue pieces to these relationships before you enter into any partnership. Make sure you understand who's behind the partnership and uh, how are they making money to, to make sure that you get a fair share of that as well. All right. Thank you, Larry. Um, here's another one. Isn't crypto mostly used for illicit activities? Yeah, that's, I think I typed on that a little bit earlier. Um, it, that probably early on in crypto's, uh, life cycle, that was the case, maybe 15, 20% back in the early days. Uh, as of late though, it's really fallen to less than a quarter percent. So it's, it's actually used less for illicit transactions than cash, so it's not really as high risk of an activity as a lot of people might assume, especially as more institutional monies have moved into that space. Yeah, and I'd add to that, when you think about, say, suspicious activity reporting, as financial institutions have started to understand a little bit more what they need to be reporting on the uh, any cryptocurrency transactions, so say if you're adding the public key to your SAR report, uh, it's making it a little bit more difficult to get away with that sort of activity, and people are starting to realize that anything that ever happened with that public key is pretty much immutably and permanently available on that chain. All right, uh, thank you, Ryan and Larry. I think we went a bit over time, but as a reminder, all registrants will receive a link to the recording via email. And we'd like to thank you for joining us today and we hope you'll join us on a future webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day and thank you. Thank you.